thank you guys for joining me. Uh, <clears throat> for those that don't know me, my name is Kadis Tasfai, and I'll be moderating this session today on how interoperability will shape the future of financial inclusion and digital financial services. Um, so again, thanks for everyone that registered early and is joining us on time. We truly appreciate that. Um, and a special thanks to our speakers for today um, <clears throat> and their willingness to share some of their experience and expertise with us. Uh, in a little bit, I will go ahead and introduce them briefly. Um, before we jump into the session, a couple of housekeeping items that I wanted to go over. Um, so anyone in this session today may submit um, questions live in the chat box below. As you can see, there's a, a box you can click there. So during any time of the discussion, feel free to uh, pose any questions and we'll come back to those during question and answer or as we take um, quick breaks in between. Um, and we'll begin on time and end on time as well. You know, we respect your time. And this session will be recorded and shared. So if you have to leave early or um, want to revisit the conversation, we'll be sharing that with you as well. Um, and the session overall will begin with kind of an overview about the topic and we'll give each of the speakers you know, time for opening remarks and overview from their line of work and expertise. Um, and that will be kind of what it, will look, what it would look like. Um, so again, thank you for joining us and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so what brings us together today? Um, as you all know, you know, the different sectors of the economy are getting linked to the financial sector uh, like never before, especially here in Ethiopia, as well as globally. Um, and, you know, the market players are no longer um, limited to the traditional banks. Uh, you know, this includes various forms of payment options and electronic transaction methods being available now um, compared to before. Um, so with that in mind, you know, none of these issues or elements can be viewed in isolation. Um, in order to ensure a seamless communication and network and system integration, um, tools, you know, tools that will be employed by different service providers um, should be able to communicate. Um, exchange and use data and process data as well. So this is generally what interoperability is uh, in the financial service market. And the lack of it um, can also be a challenge and there's opportunities that come with that. So today we'll take some time to kind of unpack some of these challenges and understand where we're at in Ethiopia um, and kind of hear from the current national um, stakeholder um, and the various stakeholders in the private sector and also the public sector and discuss what are some of those key issues um, and what can we really consider and think about as we are all engaging in the system and in the ecosystem one way or another. Um, so with that background in mind, um, I would like to introduce the speakers and the experts that are here with us today. Um, so first we have Yildabes Addis, who is the CEO of Switch, the National Switch of Ethiopia. He has worked in technology and financial and financial sector for over 20 years. And he specifically focused in the areas of ICT systems and digital financial services. Uh, and then we have Salomon Damto, uh, who's an expert in the regulatory and policy environment in the financial sector. He's worked at the National Bank of Ethiopia for the last 10 years and has deep knowledge um, in the current national strategies that are in place, financial inclusion efforts and Ethiopia's path towards expansion of access to financial services. And he's here today with us as an individual expert and is not representing the National Bank of Ethiopia, just on a side note. Um, and we also have Teddy Tasso, who is an independent consultant working in the financial sector in areas of digital financial services, e-commerce, payment systems, financial inclusion uh, and development programs. He's worked in this space for a decade, both in private and public sector. So we'll get to hear from these three experts' backgrounds and wealth of knowledge um, in this topic. So without further ado, um, I would like to invite Idlebes Addis to kind of share with us an overview of what interoperability is and where we are today and what um, Eastwich is doing today to enable the ecosystem to achieve interoperability. So I'll go ahead and allow you to share your screen, Idlebes, and we can get started with that. I'm waiting for you to allow me to share screen. Okay, thank you, it's yes. coming. Uh, thank you very much. 
Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, Akatas. Thank you, Precise Consult, for organizing this webinar. And uh, I'm going to uh, present about interoperability on uh, financial technology and uh, financial inclusion. Uh, so we start with the a definition of the uh, interoperability, uh, as most of you may be familiar with this, which is uh, taken from the Licensing Organization and Payment System Operators Directive uh, by the National Bank of Ethiopia. Uh, interoperability means a technical or legal uh, compatibility that enables a system or a scheme to be used in conjunction with other systems or schemes. It allows participants in different systems or schemes to process, clear, and settle payments or financial uh, transactions across systems or schemes without participating in multiple systems or schemes. That's the definition. So uh, why we need, uh, basically why we need the interoperability. So the key uh, drivers for the need of interoperability is one, to introduce economics of scale and scope and create a network effect for the players in the, in the financial, digital financial uh, services and uh, payments and improve financial inclusion, which is the key player in a financial inclusion and more access and convenience to the customers. So it uh, addresses and uh, the requirements or the demands of all players, the business, the customer, the uh, financial service providers. So when we look at the interoperability ecosystem, there is interoperability ecosystem at the middle, and then it creates interoperability between different players. So these players can be uh, mobile wallet uh, providers, microfinance institutions, government uh, departments mainly, or their uh, services in which their payments or different collections can be made from uh, various financial institutes, uh, any jobs uh, and any jobs and car terminals and the point of sales, money transfer organizations, retailers, and merchants and banks. So in the ecosystem, all uh, of these uh, uh, players are participating in the interoperable ecosystem. So the, each of them will get a uh, value from the interoperability. Uh, so why, uh, what kinds of interoperability arrangements are there? So commonly uh, CGAP uh, definition and this arrangement, one is a multilateral arrangement, which includes three or more uh, providers. Uh, and there is a bilateral arrangement. And uh, previously before this interoperability becomes uh, popular, it was the common one was this bilateral arrangement that uh, can be made between two uh, institutes. So they share their uh, own requirements, both the technical business requirements and uh, the business rules. So that will be an agreement between two companies. And there is also independent third party solution providers that creates interoperability on behalf of uh, different uh, players. So here, each of them, they, there are uh, different uh, key features on each of them. If we take uh, from participants perspective and in multilateral agreements, uh, there are more than two digital financial service providers. Uh, in the case of bilateral agreements, there are uh, two DFS providers. And in the third party uh, solutions, so a DFS provider and a third party solution provider, because that third party solution provider will arrange uh, with others, other DFS or other aggregators. When you look at the operational model and the uh, business rules, in the case of multilateral agreements, it's agreed by all participants that is applicable to the next uh, coming uh, subsequent members. When we look at the bilateral uh, agreements, it's an agreement between these two parties, but the third party solution is agreed between the third party and the uh, provider. So usually in this uh, modality, it's uh, unilaterally uh, set by the a third party that has the upper hand to set uh, the rules and operational models. So depending on the value that they can get, it will vary from one uh, uh, provider to another provider. It depends on the size and the volume on the business that they, are, they can bring. So it's not the specific operational model and business rule. 
Uh, and the other key feature that we can look at in the interoperability arrangement is pricing, that's including transparency to customers. The multilateral arrangement scales, it provides optimal or a potential alignment and transparency through broader market uh, coordination. But the bilateral, it will be more of an agreement between these two uh, institutes, uh, more difficult to align and effectively communicate. Mm, uh, it is uh, uh, usually an arrangement, a negotiation between uh, these two companies. So that the, we don't expect that much uh, transparency as well. When it comes to a third party, there's a potential for a single price without a coordination. But that single price uh, setting organization will evaluate the providers and provide different uh, pricing. And they, it will not be transparent. The final one is a technical implementation uh, observer. Here, the switch uh, or bilateral connection and a third party or aggregators will be set depending on the parties in the multilateral agreement. But when it comes to bilateral, it's a bilateral or a third party, they can agree on a third party or aggregator. Usually the third one is a third party or aggregator. So what are the key issues that um, have to be addressed in the interoperability. So the, the, there are four key issues. One is the trust issue, second is economics, and the third is technology and regulatory. So depending on the type of the implementation, uh, there is the, the service and what will be in the proprietary environment. If you look at the proprietary environment for ATM transactions, all are in plus because they, when we look at from a trust issue, there is well uh, regulated bank or financial institute, a technology, that technology is uh, also from a trust organization and all the technology will be tested and ready. Economics, it's a set by that financial institute, regulatory. So everything will be in plus for all ATM or POS or mobile transactions. But when we look at an interoperable environment, all of them require to be reworked depending on the uh, environment or depending on the type of the arrangements. So uh, how do we solve these issues? They, when, it come, when we come to the uh, interoperability, uh, mainly I'm looking at those in the multilateral ag agreements. There must be the membership criteria, a clear participation rule, governance rules, a clear transaction formatting, transaction handling, dispute management, and the, the liability allocation and risk management and a cost sharing, depending on the setup on the process as well. So we look at, when we look at also solving economics issue, which is a key issue, so we need a well-defined interoperable business model. Usually this is a key success that can accommodate all players and that creates and uh, the motivation to all participants finally can bring and reala uh, um, realize the interoperability and can bring additional players, which will also contribute to the volume. And finally, there must be a continuous improvement for the rules for the business model, depending on the, uh, uh, the interests of the players. So when we look at the economics issues, the key issues to be solved are the processing fee, the interchange fee and the customer fees, depending on the, the, the type of the arrangement and depending on the agreement of the participants, all these issues are required to be addressed. And finally, we look at the technology issue. So when we look at the technology issue, they, there must be a scheme rule and a technology that can enable this message, authentication, routing, clearing, settlement, and so on. So when all players should uh, also have the standard uh, message or a transaction flow and the standard message uh, requirements. So uh, there must be the, a facilitation for arbitration in the process of dispute. So there is a need of a dispute management system and the system has to support that. And a transaction management system, a clearing, reconciliation and authentication and the authorization systems are required. So here, first you set these and the scheme rules then there must be a system that can support these scheme rules. And when we we'll come to the regulatory issue, there's a national payment system regulatory framework. 
actually that comes from starting from the program engine or directives and then the the the, the payment system policies procedures rules and we'll look at from the governance perspective and how will be the governance of that interoperability environment we we look at the the proclamation from uh, parliament level then a directive from the central bank then a payment system management body or a board and executive management depending on the uh, setup of the country i think uh, if we yeah, if i take you know, for the sake of time uh, if i take one case for the post purchase there are in the, in the uh, four key players, and we usually call this four-party model, the acquirer, the transaction acquiring bank, the card issuing bank, and the customer and the merchant involves. So the transaction flow will also uh, uh, depend on the type of the arrangements. And depending uh, on these different flows of the uh, transaction, there will be also the uh, processing or interchange fees. I think uh, I would like to pause here. Next is the uh, financial inclusion uh, slide. Uh, should I uh, proceed, Kades? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> no. Thank you. Thank you for that um, general overview and kind of very key and important um, challenges that you mentioned. So you know a lot of these these components of interoperability, you know complications to to the system um you know what are the implications of the such challenges and what are the possible of interoperability that that will exist uh yeah uh, uh, yeah those the challenges can be categorized in those areas uh, those four uh, areas they from uh, a regulatory perspective from the trust perspective from the technology perspective from the economic uh, perspective. If we say all oh, uh, the regulatory is in place and the trust issues through the regulatory is safe and the, the economics mm, is also well there. So the, the, the challenge uh, at the initial stage will be the agreement and accommodating the requirements and the interests of all players will be the key uh, challenge because sometimes those already existing players, uh, proprietary system owners, they may think that in the, the system that will create interoperability will be a competitor for them, which is the, the misunderstanding basically, but they're actually it enables them. And the, the second area I can mention at this level is the challenge in terms of the, the technology. So it requires, uh, there are multiple players and each player having their own uh, legacy systems. So creating interoperability to that uh, legacy system and adapting to the new uh, API requirements or standard enterprise service bus will be also the, the technical challenge. And because sometimes it may also uh, affect their business uh, flow. So initially, if there is already existing standard systems, may, if I refer our, uh, our case in our country, so initially all of them, they do have the at least core banking system. So that was not a challenge for banks. But if they, when MFIs come, for instance, they don't have the core banking system, their, their IT maturity level is low, that will be a challenge to actually entertain them in the interoperable environment. So the challenge will be spread over all those key areas. Would you say that uh, currently those challenges are being effectively addressed? Or are they still in the nascent phase of being identified currently? Uh, if I take the, the, the current situation, because they, uh, this, the, the, the challenge in the, at times of establishment is already at risk. The national switch established in 2011, and uh, that establishment, the formation period challenge that already at risk. Now they are not here. Now the, the challenge now is, taking to the market and creating an uh, awareness and understanding of each player. If I take, for instance, one of the challenges in the post is, I, I will look at next in the next slide. There are multiple posts in uh, one supermarket. So when they serve, they, though the interoperability is created, how do they set 
how should we take only one of them and they can start serving using one that one host or not which bank can they decide and uh, remove and retain one of them that is still uh, the challenge on the placement on the uh, atms as well as process then the, the next challenge that we are currently uh, that we can consider is the new uh, players and the clarity maybe my colleagues will come to those uh, challenges actually they are not direct links to the national search but it is you know, more challenges on the technology and the players uh, interoperability creating yeah. interoperability for those players other yeah no, definitely come back to this question to the other speakers as well. Uh, it seems like the other few questions that were brought up, I think you'll go over in the next part of your, your presentation. So let's present, and we'll come back to some of these questions. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you. So the next, uh, we look at the, the role of interoperability or how interoperability improves financial inclusion. The interoperability, if we look at the two key pillars of the financial inclusion, one is overcoming challenges to accessibility, second is increasing affordability. So the interoperability will play a key role in these areas. In terms of uh, a challenge to accessibility, we create complete channel interoperability will increase accessibility and availability. It will create interoperability between uh, mobile, between uh, online, which are commonly available at the hands of the consumers. Interoperability also provides better access to financial service providers. So it will not li be limited only to one financial uh, service provider. So they can access their own uh, bank or MFI through this interoperability, but using the channels of other financial institutes. Interoperability will also build trust and reduces barriers to use financial uh, services. The availability of one channel with, with whichever financial institute is owned or deployed that can be uh, used to serve all other uh, customers as well. Interoperability also enables the service providers to collect their payments electronically. So government service providers, uh, aggregators, merchants, school, and the, the, all they can uh, easily uh, collect their payments. So it can ease the, the payment collection. And finally, in terms of addressing the challenges to accessibility is all financial cases can be uh, 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 availed through uh, financial institutes by the interoperable service provider. And the, in terms of the increasing affordability, interoperability also provide access to cheaper channels or all available channels. Will, we look at the channels that are at the hands of the consumers. It brings more use cases, which drives more volume than each financial institute or each service provider connecting with each service provider. They can be connected to the interoperability uh, service provider or the national switch. And it also increases the volume, which directly has impact on the affordability because it decreases the cost and the of the the, the that price will be afforded. Finally, uh, the interoperability uh, 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 brings a competitiveness to digital transactions with cash, so more customers will go to the digital. So we look at from the uh, Ethiopia perspective, the interoperability in Ethiopia, from regulatory perspective, we do have the, the proclamation for national payment system proclamation. We have a director license, a directive, licensing authorization of payment system operator. And from economic model, the business model, it's a share company, a national switch with a common goal and creating interoperability. And the national switch is owned by all financial institutes. In institutes. When we look at from the trust perspective, there is a clear membership criteria and there is a participant agreement and a system rule, dispute management and settlement rule, and a common brand and shared services and revenue split model. So that, uh, uh, that aligns with the interests of all players. When we look at from the technology perspective, we have a card scheme, TOP card scheme, and a scheme rule uh, and support of the technology, messaging standards and solutions that can split the, the fee, well as uh, that can also manage the dispute and a settlement and a compliance to business and 
risk rules. Finally, the arbitration process supports that. So if we look at the ecosystem in uh, currently in the national switch, you may see also the, the back uh, of uh, me, which is on the wall. Participants, we look at both direct and indirect participants. The participants are those licensed by the National Bank of Ethiopia, but the users can be any user, the consumers, merchants, government organizations, non-government organizations, financial, non-financial service providers. But actually, we don't directly provide service to consumers or merchants. We provide those services through uh, financial institutes. And we enable financial institutes and businesses. And we look at the core, the services, and we divide into core third party and enable services. Core services are the services that are only provided by being the national switch, a third party services that are the services in which we can provide because we don't have the data like the research and providing a training. And since we don't have infrastructure, we can also provide a hosting service. Those enabled services are those services or we call products. These services are enabled through the, the financial institutes. So uh, we call them enabled services. Finally, we look at what are the, in the channels that we create interoperability. We already created interoperability between ATMs, uh, and we were like for the past five years, we are creating, we already created interoperability on POS, which is live in the few months back, which was in a pilot since February 2020. And a mobile and internet are currently uh, in the testing uh, process or the pilot process. Uh, so if you look at the, the EFT switch ownership in Ethiopia, so there are six banks owning their own switch, six banks a shared switch, and six banks hosted at the national switch. Blue, I, I just want to highlight the a study that has been done in 2018. The market share uh, for ATM was high, uh, post very low as you look at, mobile better, and online internet very low, and the maturity level availability which was there for ATM, for post, and mobile as well, but very low when it comes to online or e-commerce. The year, I'm just flashing the uh, transaction last year. Uh, it shows how the transaction is growing. When COVID, uh, the first case of COVID introduced in March, it started declining. But next, then in April, it started going up. So it's continually, continuously increasing. Uh, so transaction growth is uh, continuously increasing. I just want to yeah. highlight the yeah sorry all right yeah i think just do, do with time i mean that i mean that's a great summary you know ultimately interoperability can promote competition uh, can increase the financial viability of service offerings you know by reducing the fixed cost unblock, you know, unlocking economies of scale um improving the utility payment instruments and convenience for the user and all these elements are generally considered to facilitate financial inclusion, which I really want us to get to um, next, if that's okay, Labas. Uh, and I think some of the questions that were also raised have been addressed. And after um, Salomon and Teddy also speak, a lot of the questions that are raised will be covered by, by their remarks. So I really want to get a chance to uh, look at some of those. Um, so if I may invite Salomon to... You can hear me. And thank you, Ilava. So You're welcome. Very insightful. Uh, and there will be some questions that will definitely be um, posed to you as well. I think we can hear you. Salomon? Have you given me my, as a chance? So should yes. I continue? Okay, yes. great. Give you okay. Uh, thank you very much for having me in this uh, webinar session and I'm very happy to be the part of this uh, interesting topic which is interoperability. So most of the concept of uh, the interoperability is already addressed by uh, Mr. Inlavas uh, in a well manner, uh, but uh, in very uh, in very summarized way, interoperability is just a matter of accessing uh, of the systems and the services by the end user. So. Uh, that is creating the enabling environment for the end users to access the financial services 
without uh, any bottlenecks uh, like uh, uh, the infrastructure or the system or being a remote area or being to a near area. So just interoperability, the focus, the, the core area is just to create the access of uh, the services to the end user uh, without just uh, 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 creating a problem regarding the, um, the system infrastructure and the other issues. So uh, the major objective so that to, if it is creating of this accessibility, uh, it has an, an, an major um, benefits for the government as well for the lawmakers, especially. So uh, making the payment system is efficient, reliable, and affordable is the responsibility of the government, particularly for the central bank. So this uh, main uh, objective could be uh, achieved by creating uh, efficient interoperability so, uh, so that uh, the interoperability agenda is not the market agenda, it's also the government's agenda, uh, especially the regulatory bodies' agenda. So that by this interoperability, uh, the government can assure that the accessibility of the system, the efficiency of the system, and uh, the reliability of the system, and uh, affordability of the system as well. Uh, so that uh, the usually most of the countries uh, provide legal instruments or uh, provide an uh, enabling environment to, to create uh, uh, interoperability among the system and the services. So that uh, here in Ethiopia also the same uh, objective that the central bank also uh, has. Uh, uh, as of now, for example, the interoperability is achieved uh, uh, on, on the bank system, meaning that is all banks, banking has interconnected through the Ethiopian national payment system. Uh, which means that a given customer can pay transaction from from the bank uh, from wherever he uh, he is or she is uh, can to anybody uh, 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 within the bank's account uh, through the national payment system, meaning that through RTG. So now we have an 18 banks. Those banks are interconnected to the national payment system or RTG system. And the messages are transferred through interbank. I mean, interbank processing, of course, that is stressful processing, so that all banks are now interconnected. Um, but uh, when it comes to the retail payments, particularly on uh, the customer-based payments like uh, mobile-based payments or card-based payments, and um, online-based payments are uh, are not so far uh, fully interconnected or interoperable. Uh, due to uh, lots of issues are there, but uh, we have a national switch uh, that uh, Mr. Lovas is leading uh, that have the responsibility to create this uh, interconnectivity or interoperability among us of our retail payment uh, systems. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the central uh, uh, legal instruments on this area, particularly on the payment system, operators licensing and authorization, directive, uh, which gives a full um, authority and responsibility to the national switch to uh, maintain this interoperability. And every participant in the market, in the payment system market, also obliged to connect its system uh, towards this, uh, the national switch. So this is one requirement that every participant in the payment system or in the financial sector in general is required to connect its system with the national switch so that all of its services can be accessed uh, regardless of the, the, the users uh, that is using a system. So whatever the system that the user is using, so it can access whatever the service that is uh, available in the financial sector. So this is the ultimate objective uh, that uh, the uh, interoperability. But for specific purpose of today's webinar about the financial inclusion. So, uh, you know that access to finances, it is really, really in a key area where the economic development can be achieved. So this access to finance, uh, uh, especially financial services like uh, uh, saving and uh, credit is really, really it matters a lot. So how we achieve this access to finance or financial services to the rural areas or to those who are uh, not uh, have direct access to, to the traditional financial uh, institutions. 
So by uh, digital, no, digital finance plays a key role here. So you can reach out to very remote areas uh, by ha just having of the mobile phone. So you can access uh, to those uh, uh, individuals, those who do not have a direct interaction with the financial institution. So through so your phone, you can reach out there. So you can provide I mean, credit to them. You can also provide uh, deposit or saving services for them. You can also even provide an micro insurance for them, whatever the services. But th there should be a richness of the services uh, through this digital way. So if that is maintained so that, and if there is an interoperability also maintained in between of different uh, digital financial service providers. So um, and a given user can also uh, uh, get the services regardless of the uh, system that that user is using or the regardless of the institution that that user is using. So it really uh, it really uh, it has a key impact uh, in in achieving of interoperability. So as far as I know, the central bank also very keen uh, in creating of this interoperability between uh, the systems and the. Uh, 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 financial service providers. So that's that's why we put uh, the central bank has put uh, in, the, in its directive uh, to uh, to make that uh, all participants has to interconnect. That is a requirement. So that is the objective. So that uh, all of the through this interoperability, since it is the government's agenda, so it creates or it uh, maintains efficiency. That is the major one in the financial sector. So if the given service uh, is not efficient, so that erodes the customer's uh, trust, as uh, uh, Levis was saying, the trust is very important, in particular in digital payments. And it also enables innovation. So look, uh, it, I mean, so to be innovative, it is a bit expensive, you see, uh, so that, and, uh, startup capitals, for example, I mean startup companies, for example, like fintech companies, they are may not have an adequate capital to test, to provide full-scale services, and even to access the critical systems like settlement systems, RTG systems, or clearing house systems. They, it may be very costly for them, but if you create interoperability, so they can test it, they can uh, uh, develop their product and services then they can uh, provide it for the larger uh, user. So that creates and uh, promotes innovation if we have interconnectivity. So you can test it your system with, an, with, with, with the system which is already live in the, in the market. The other common uh, objective of interoperability from the central bank's perspective is standardization. So standardization meaning that, so it, it creates the, 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 the common platform or the common way of transmitting messages and the way the, the common way of uh, transmitting the transactions and the clearing and the settlement so if that standardization is achieved so the payment and the financial service will be very easy so that's one and the other is as we have discussed that's inclusion so all of this is uh, all of this is achieved through interop interoperability uh, that is uh, by creating what uh, enabling environment for competition. So if, by the way, interoperability is in an infrastructure where we are not competing uh, with the, the interoperability. In interoperability has to be in a public infrastructure. Everyone has to use that. So the but competition has to with the competition has to be with the service, with the innovative uh, product like that. But the government's agenda is to create interoperability, which is uh, not for competition. So everybody can come and can provide its service with this uh, interoperability. So this is what what and I can say. And uh, if you have, uh, if there is a question, I will back uh, get this. Thank you. That's not, no, thank you for that. I mean, and no wonder what the government has made it one of their priority areas because it has such a potential to introduce economies of scale and scope and create network effects and allow customers to easily use and uh, effectively transact without all of these um, challenges. So I think that's definitely great to hear. I do want to hear from Teddy before we 
get to some of the specific questions that are raised so we can hear a little bit about the digital financial services side and some of your experience around that that you want to share with us today teddy thank you thank you Kadist. so i think my colleagues have perfectly explained in terms of what interoperability is and what is what is happening in terms of uh, the role ETO switch is playing in terms of us uh, national switch operator. Maybe I want to emphasize on first why we need interoperability. Why? Because first of all, we need digital payments. So as you know, in Ethiopia currently more than 90% of the transactions are happening uh, using cash as a medium. And this, as a, from a national point of view, we want to switch from a cash transaction to uh, electronic types of transaction in all aspects of uh, uh, business or any types of service exchanges. So in order, when we try to switch from a cash to a digital economy in terms of, so payments becomes very important. And when we speak about digital payments, then in a country where there is a multiple types of payments, then uh, interoperability becomes a key discussion point. So interoperability is an enabler towards a digital payment system and overall into a digital uh, economy uh, in general. As you know, recently, the government of Ethiopia has issued the digital, uh, national digital uh, uh, digitalization strategy, which has uh, also includes digital payments as one of the key areas which would uh, enable in terms of the overall digital economy aspect. So, so from a national point of view, we want to move from cash to digital. And in order to do that, interoperability is a key uh, component of that transformation. So in terms of interoperability, for example, it's also what does it mean for the private sector in terms of for digital uh, businesses? So digital businesses, as you know, are reliant on the digital infrastructure. So this means that they need internet connection, they need devices, they need services and so on. So it is an economic exchange and this requires to be payment is uh, a key component. For example, in markets, uh, for example, you know, the usual suspect Kenya, you have M-Pesa, which is a big digital payment instrument, which ev almost everyone has it. But in Ethiopia, for example, we have uh, 18 and also more banks coming up and more than 35 uh, microfinance institutions. And uh, the population is banked or using a different types of financial services. So when we, as a business, for example, when we launch a digital platform or a digital type of service, then we need to receive payments through, through these customers. So what happens now in the absence of uh, interoperability is that the service provider and the service receiver or the payer, payer needs to have needs to belong in the same uh, bank or need to be using the same payment instrument, which is not the case. So at this moment, if we just look at the banks, the chances for um, a merchant, which is providing, let's say an e-commerce service and a payer, which is uh, using the e-payment uh, platform, they need, the ratio is one to 18. So that means in majority, in most cases, you go for the most dominant one, which is a CBE. So, but we want to have competition and we want to offer people a different means of paying for goods and services online. So in order to do that without interoperability, then we have a lot of hurdles. Let me give you an example. One of the use cases, for example, in terms of digital payments is uh, school payments. So a lot of banks are now going after schools and trying to become their uh, payment method in terms of collecting school fee payments. But in order to do that, what happens is the school has to have a bank account in a particular bank and all the parents of those, uh, all the parents paying for the school fees need also to have an account in that particular bank or need to physically go and pay at the branch. The reason this happens is because of lack of interoperability in terms of account to account or through digital means whereby to allow to encourage people to switch digital so unless we solve the issue of interoperability between payment systems then we cannot uh, it will not be easy for people to switch to a digital platform and adapt to digital uh, payment methods and even in digital uh, eco digital platforms or digital economy as a whole let me give you another example so one of the most popular services in Ethiopia recently is uh, ride hailing apps. You know, you have a lot of ride hailing apps and uh, according to one information that I had, there is a, an amount of close to 1 billion bir which is circulating on a monthly basis. 
through ride hailing apps such as you know uh, ride Ferris, they ride and so on but all of this transaction is happening on cash but these are digital uh, services right but why is the reason that they don't accept the digital platforms it's because of a lack of interoperability so we need to solve interoperability in order to boost or enable the digital uh, economy so i think it's very important that when we focus on uh, on why we do it and maybe one thing uh, in, in terms of the role of digital payments toward financial inclusion uh, in the majority of cases in my personal opinion the interoperability is uh, more suited to people who are already or addresses to uh, the needs of people who are already part of the financial system and interoperability would actually support the deepening of financial inclusion by creating different use cases for people on why they should have a bank account yeah so but to a certain extent it could also have a positive contribution uh, towards uh, bringing in new customers to the banking sector because at one point having a bank account would be necessary even because for to perform any types of uh, payments you need to have a bank account so in a way it could also help in terms of bringing financial inclusion uh, for the people who are unbanked but as a first i think or the uh, much faster result would be we would see it in terms of achieving our digital financial uh, digital payment strategy and also boosting the digital economy uh, one thing i would like to add is also what happens for example for digital payments at this moment so about digital financial service providers so what happens is now every digital financial service provider that could be banks or fintech companies are trying to be uh, build their own island they they try to build their own distribution networks through agents or through atms or point of sales they try to do their own acquisition of customers so that to create an ecosystem whereby two uh, two people or two accounts are able to communicate or perform transaction at once but this is difficult to achieve at a scale because of the you know ethiopia is a big country you need to have as many people as possible using your uh, within the same platform so i think the much shorter and more scalable way would be by promoting scalability so that shared infrastructure can be used so as long as one bank could have for example a big distribution network but another financial institution could have a big uh, uh, in terms of the customer base but by creating this uh, platform or way which it was which doing and also other private companies i'm sure would want to do is creating this highway so that to communicate to allow digital transaction without the need to become uh, the best or the biggest in all aspects of uh, service delivery that's that's for me no that was that was fantastic thank you teddy um so thank you all for your remarks now we're going to just jump right in uh, to the q a session for the next 25 minutes um so i've been trying to over a lot of the questions trying to synthesize and combine some of these questions. Some have already been answered, but um, there's questions around, you know, what is currently expected or what are the roles of the various players in the ecosystem? Um, and how do you guys believe that trust is being built from the public and private sector? You know, there's concerns around um, conflict of interest, heavy government influence, um, and does interoperability level the playing field for small startups against the might of CBE or Ethio Telecom, for example. Um, who'd like to start and take a job at that? Actually, why don't we have um, I think that would be a great question for you to start with and we can hear from the others as well. Uh, all right, uh, I, I think I was addressing some of the questions on the, the chat. Uh, and the the so question that's that related well. to, yeah. The question that was related to the startup is uh, basically we provide a API uh, to financial institutes and aggregators. So these aggregators may be startups as long as they uh, don't have the use cases, they can use those aggregators. The new uh, directive, maybe they can look at from the directive. Uh, there are the rules of the national switch and which when we fulfill all those, that will also, we will also enable uh, those startups in providing, now apart from providing the APIs and uh, checking and uh, assuring quality of 
the, 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 their products in terms of uh, creating interoperability or providing the financial services and fulfilling the, the standard requirements. So we will also publish those standard requirements for that. Thank you. Maybe you can pick those questions, or whichever question. Yeah. Of course, and I think I would love to hear also Salomon on this piece about you know concerns around uh, the would there be a, a level playing playing field for for the private sector as well, um, and is there conflict of interest, and is there a heavier influence from the government? Is that regulatory? Are there implications around that? And what what are your thoughts around um, some of these concerns? And what should people's engagement and roles be um, when they are engaging in the stakeholder or in the ecosystem, excuse me. I think you're on mute, hold on. Yeah, hello, you hear me? Yes, yes. Good, so uh, as I mentioned before, the interoperability is, um, of course, there are two models in the world. So some of the countries uh, try to create this interoperability at the public level, uh, at the public level, yes, like Ethiopia, and uh, some of others are at the private level. But I think my perception uh, is in Ethiopia, we are trying to create interoperability at the public level. So that is the agenda, the government agenda. So what the private sector has to do is, um, uh, of course, they have to use that and they have to be aware of the infrastructure and how to make payments and how that the, the payments are processed. And from the private, um, from the public sector, including the central bank, also, I, 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 I as, uh, as a regulatory body, uh, I, I look at the issue which as a pub public, I mean, a, a public uh, good. So from the issue which side, issue which has to be an, a very efficient and has to provide an, uh, uh, a single uh, uh, interoperability point and it has also a responsibility to uh, make sure the clearing the settlement process of all digital payments that have been made across the ecosystem uh, is safe and efficient. So that is the expectable from uh, the e switch. And from the uh, third party players like fintech companies or gateway providers, post, pro post service providers, ATM service providers, are, they have to make their system very efficient to be integrated with the uh, central systems like e switch uh, and they have also enabled the the end users uh, 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 to use their system in very uh, efficient manner without any uh, uh, obstacle so but the main the main uh, responsibilities goes to the uh, to the government to create this uh, interoperability so as far as uh, I know, the so Ethiopian government or the central bank have so made a lot of efforts to create this uh, interoperability uh, so the national switch. Uh, and of course, uh, currently it also issued an, uh, a regulatory instrument to enable or uh, to define the role and the responsibility of this uh, national switch, which is going to play in the interoperable uh, area. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, the next question that was um, raised, I think this will be back to you, Teddy, and you mentioned a little bit about the various use cases, um, but you know, some, there's various use cases, obviously, and right now, progress has remained slow in Ethiopia, um, as there's been an increasing number of use cases and the volume of transactions per use case as well. So how is the digital financial service domain being influenced uh, by the current interoperability status and how many use cases do we have currently? Um, where is that kind of going? Are there concerns around that? If you can just speak a little bit on that. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. So currently the digital, I mean, the interoperability case, I think as Ilves has presented earlier, there is a lot of good progress. For example, ATM interoperability is in place and recently point of selling interoperability is in place. So this is a very good development, but maybe one thing also here I would like to comment is uh, the level of awareness level is still yet to be near further in terms of efforts. For example, I still see some people who are not aware that they could use their uh, cards from any ATMs. 
So this kind of, this shows you there is a gap in terms of awareness. I think there is a lot of effort required by the financial service providers in ETO switch in terms of educating the customer. I have seen recently also some, uh, some uh, campaigns that, are, that have recently been started to educate the customers on the possibility. Uh, similarly, also uh, card payments is very at early stage in Ethiopia and basically uh, limited in terms of, uh, because of also considering it's recently started. So this also requires further education and investing a lot of money uh, to make sure that people know about it and create trust is created. There is also a need for in terms of dispute resolution and so on, which will also uh, complement in terms of creating uh, how do you call it, convenience. Uh, but one area which I think would be instrumental in terms of uh, expanding the use case is the online payments. Online payments could be via uh, mobile, mobile phones or internet. In most cases in Ethiopia, I would assume it would be in mobile banking, whereby interoperability between uh, mobile wallets, so mobile wallets and uh, accounts to accounts and uh, uh, vice versa. So this would be very important because uh, if you look at ATM, the use cases is limited. It's mostly for withdrawal services. And if you look at uh, point of uh, card payments, it requires POS in our case, in current uh, modality. Of course, there are some advanced uh, mobile posts that are coming up, but still it is limited to the number of point of sale machines that are available. So uh, recent statistics maybe uh, my other panelists would have, but it's, it's around 10 to 12,000 point of sale devices that are there. And there is a lot of cleaning up required in terms of making sure they are placed in the right location. But when you activate a mobile phone or a self-service kind of services, then you really expand the use cases. For example, use cases could, would be expanded to e-commerce, for example, which is really flourishing in Ethiopia. You can, you can have like ride services, as I mentioned earlier, uh, sports betting is very popular currently and a lot of mobile money companies are utilizing or building on that aspect uh, as well. And also uh, following the recent uh, regulations regards to cash limitations and uh, transaction and exchange of currency and so on, I would also expect a lot of use case to be for person-to-person -person transfer using a regular accounts as well. So this, this would also increase the use case and that's why account to account or wallet to wallet uh, user interoperability would be very crucial in terms of taking it to the next level and expanding the uh, use cases beyond cash out and beyond just payments as well. There is also, I think there is also a lot of effort or uh, opportunity for uh, private sector who are in the digital space uh, to build up on that because the financial sector would, would develop the infrastructure, the means to, enable transactions, but then it's up to the private sector, to entrepreneurs, to startups, who will use that opportunity and create uh, goods and services that will be exchanged and create new types of use cases that we, know, we have not even thought about. Of course, there is uh, uh, SMEs, access to credits as well, which could also be uh, one use case and also micro, micro credits for individuals as well. So these are all of the areas where interoperability would be uh, increasing in terms of adoption and also growth. No, definitely. I think um, that's really great to hear. I mean, as all of you have mentioned um, throughout the session, perhaps more important um, than whether interoperability exists is the question of whether interoperability is expand access to financial services, right? Ultimately, we're talking about financial inclusion, we're talking about the formal economy. Um, the most objective of progress is whether consumers are actively um, transacting between provider accounts, right? And furthermore, you know, data on transaction volumes are different to find in many countries. We, we've seen in many reports, um, despite the lengthy searches that, that they undergo and the repeated requests and the the very absence of available data has forced you know, us to conclude uh, that transaction volumes between providing you know, providers um, are low in such markets as Ethiopia, assumption. Um, but is it true in Ethiopia? You know, what, what are the issues around data and who owns this data that's, that's um, happening um, throughout all these transactions? I think I would love to, um, Salamon, and also you'd love us, one of you guys to, to jump on that question. If I'm not missed you, so you have asked about the data ownership.
I'm not hear you. I'm not hear you. That's right. The data ownership. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Yes, the data ownership as well as is it accessible? Is it easily traceable and trackable? And um, does it show that there has been lower transaction volumes? Or, you know, are we able to see the, the volume? Yeah, it, it's a really great question. So, um, so the, the, regarding with the data, so the the data is owned by the financial institution. So the owners, the ownership of the data is goes to the financial institution. It is as per the regulation of the national banks. So the individual's data is belongs to the financial institution, and the, the financial institution are even not allowed to disclose it with the third parties. Uh, unless the court or like that is ordered. So uh, again, we follow the same uh, principle. So the data is a very, very uh, uh, important element where the regulatory is focused. Uh, so that uh, the same thing that we are, the central bank has provided on its uh, uh, directive, particularly in the payment system operator directive, so the data, even these sort of parties are not uh, even hold any individual data on their system. So they have to uh, just process it and send it to the financial institution. So the data ownership is belongs to the financial institution when it comes when it, when it comes to as a as an institution, but it is belongs to the individual. So it is not uh, the. I think the central bank also uh, see this very critically. The the, the compliance of uh, this uh, the data uh, disclosure. Uh, so really, of course, one of the risks that the usually the regulators look into is how this data is protected, the safety. So you know that uh, the artificial intelligence are a lot, and they do it a lot of things with your with individual spending behavior like like that. So, but the financial data that the individuals are uh, the individual has on that specific uh, system has to be very safe and confidential and has to be stored on the eligible institution, which in case, which is in our, in our case is the financial institution. So that is, that's really a great, great question. So the, the, the uh, direction that the central bank is following us uh, is this one. And I mean, if, if we can hear from Yilebis on this, I mean, what sort of data is each switch collecting? And is that being provided to all of the, the owners um, that are part of that network? Uh, it, I think it's already addressed. That's why I kept uh, silent. It's a regulatory issue that's owned by uh, the financial institutions. Yeah. Great. So one other question that was brought up, let me go back to it. Um, you know, I think we haven't fully answered the question about, you know, how can stakeholders play a role to ensure proper execution and a healthy competition is, fo is fostered within the ecosystem. Um, there has been mentions of, you know, certain dominant players in the market um, not wanting to engage due to fear of losing their, their consumers and so forth. Is that really a concern that stakeholders should have? And how should they view this as something that will actually advance and help them expand their services as well as contribute to financial inclusion at large? Um, they want to know more about, you know, what their role should be and in, in seeing this as a player. Let me say something on this, uh, especially on this, um, the stakeholders. So uh, the payment system is is the area where uh, there should be an, a competition and a fair competition. So uh, because competition has to be made by the players through uh, innovation and uh, uh, services, conveniency, services, innovation, price like that. So through this one, uh, so the inclusion may be is achieved. So interoperability is not the area where the competition has to be focused. Interoperability is, has to be in a public good, a public infrastructure, where all authorized or licensed institution can use it and has to also contribute to its efficiency. So that the, uh, the, the 
the, the role of the central bank also to avoid monopolistic kind of uh, services in the uh, payment systems. So, for example, take Kenya. Kenya in, in the MPSA services. So, it is only uh, provided by a single company, and it, it was. And I, I know that it was very hard and very difficult to them to create interoperability, so that there is an dominant agent uh, service provider in the market, and there are small companies are there. So if the interoperability is there, so that it, so the market is going to be shared among the, the small companies. So that that is that makes the MPSA to to lose the market. So that, but in in the expense of the financial inclusion, in the expense of efficiency, in the expense of innovation. So that here in Ethiopia, it is not kind of such model that we are using. So infrastructure and interoperability is, is considered as a common infrastructure where everybody can access it. So the competition should be on the service and innovative, innovation, service, technology, and pricing level and the convenience level. So that is that is the understanding from the regulator uh, body. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, kind of to add to that, I think Salomon also, if Teddy, want, if you want to chime in, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of conversation around, you know, innovation. We have to innovate um, these spaces and, you know, we have, different providers now, fintech um, companies that are calling themselves fintech providers, and now they're actually seen as financial service providers. There's aggregators, there's te technical technology providers, all of these, these things, but there isn't, like fintech isn't, there's no directive for fintech companies um, and such, or you know, the question of does innovation come first or regulation comes first? How is that really practiced currently today? And you know, these are some of the challenges that that they face because they feel like there isn't really a space for them to 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 know where their space is. You're kind of in this ambiguous kind of space, understanding it. So, you know, Teddy, from your perspective, how is that in the private sector, and how is that felt, and how do they maneuver these spaces? And then, from the regulation perspective, how is it defined um, in the regulation space? Okay, thank you, Kaddis. Uh, so, uh, are you able to hear me? I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, sure. So, I mean, we always use Kenya as uh, in terms of com the best practices in terms of digital financial services, which is, which is good, which is perfect, you know. But we should also see it from a benchmarking point of view, but not in a way that we can replicate it. Because uh, we have... Kenya and Ethiopia, we have our own set of different history in terms of politically, historically, and also in particular into our telecom sector, our financial sector as well. So always referring to the Kenya model may not be the best or may not be feasible for our specific context. So in a way, we should also learn from the best in terms of Kenya, India, or any other countries which have a similarity to our context, but we should, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a rule book that we should also be, we need to be following because at some point we cannot. To give you an example, the private sector or the private financial sector started in Ethiopia less than 30 years ago. Previously, it was a state owned kind of uh, approach. And we don't have international players, for example, uh, so with the likes of Kenya. And we don't have also, we have our own set of regulatory restrictions when it comes to international companies, international investments as well. So we have to consider this kind of specific limitations when we try to benchmark or learn from the others. So one best example, for example, we can take from Kenya is uh, in terms of uh, the regulation is uh, doesn't come, innovation comes first and the regulation comes next. Maybe in Ethiopian context, uh, that is not the case. And there are also been some discussions in terms of regulatory sandbox kind of approach and so on. But it may not also, it doesn't necessarily mean we have to do that to reach certain extent, uh, to a certain stage. So there are basic requirements that are required to reach a certain level. For example, Ethiopia is credited for its uh, stable financial sector, although not as efficient as uh, we would like it to see, but it's very stable. And part of the stability is the strong regulatory uh, and uh, supervision capacity of, in the country. So we should also be able to appreciate that. So, so to a certain extent, uh, regulation, of course, should be advanced and should try to predict and should be taking the lead. I also feel like there is uh, needs to be a balance in terms of allowing innovation to take place 
and some uh, room, but we cannot uh, argue or we cannot uh, just say that you should, we should uh, follow the Kenyan model as it is. So we need to make a balance between trying to make sure regulation because regulation has had its own values to our context and it matches to a certain extent to our history and uh, context and versus also benchmarking from best practices. Definitely. Thank you, Teddy. Um, if Salomon, if you could add kind of your um, um, perspective on that in terms of how do you guys approach some of these regulation um, requests or issues or challenges and what, what does that process look like? You know, when you are going to, um, to develop a new proclamation or directive, what does that process look like? We don't, what sort of things um, are being discussed? Hello, Curtis. Are you talking with me? Yes, Salomon. Please, can you can you uh, can you come back? I mean, uh, come again, please, on the question, please. I yeah, was on the phone. Wait, sorry. Yeah, no problem. No, so we were just talking about um, the regulation piece and how kind of Ethiopia thinks about um, generating various proclamations or directives. So we we're asking what what is the process in which you guys or the National Bank develops these policies and regulations. Um, in this space, um, what does that look like? Yeah, uh, so the good, the, uh, I think these this two directives, as far as I know, uh, they have uh, passed in a very long process and that they, they, so the Central Bank has engaged lots of parties, really. Uh, I think uh, from my experience, it is the first, the first uh, uh, directives that were engaged more than uh, 400 stakeholders, 400 entities, more than 400 entities. So that when we, uh, I mean, uh, when the central bank has prepared this uh, legal instrument, so of course, the, by its nature, it is somewhat new, uh, since it, it uh, covers some of the uh, digital part of the finance and the particular in the payment area. So. The international community, especially the uh, World Bank, MF, and uh, the Better Than Cash Alliance, a lot of lots of the international uh, expertise has has had made uh, had made their saying on um, the directive. And uh, internally, uh, here Terry also uh, here, uh, so we have engaged uh, the fintech the, the the fintech companies in Ethiopia uh, three four more times, uh, webinar on webinar basis, on uh, physical basis that we have made. And uh, we, have we have been collecting lots of comments so written uh, from uh, legal uh, persons and uh, from legal firms like that. So uh, I think, and uh, apart from that, uh, it has, the, the directive has, uh, has taken more than like six, four, uh, I mean, five, six months uh, for the central bank to to create uh, and to develop a roadmap how to we uh, regulate the services. So you mentioned earlier that should the regulation come first or should the innovation come first? So we have, I think the central bank was very, very uh, helpful to not uh, uh, disrupt the innovation, not to create obstacle for innovation. So usually when you, you, when you provide regulation uh, before the innovation, you may create some, some problem for innovation. So, but we have not been focused on the services, on the technology kind of that. But the focus has to be the requirements as an entity and on interoperability and on data management and the risk and the safety like that. But innovation area is not being regulated. So whatever uh, innovative products and the services can be introduced in the market. But, but this, of course, we are not using sandbox, sandbox approach, but we provide the uh, regulatory first. Then we see the, how this regulatory may develop the, the, the digital uh, payments particularly. But for your, uh, your specific question purpose, uh, we have been engaging the loss of loss of stakeholders, as I mentioned, more than more than uh, 400 comments that, that, that we have received uh, on this. So the engagement was very, very uh, broad. And uh, one additional thing, 
So the central bank is also uh, about to issue the national digital payment strategy, which will have a uh, vision of to create uh, an efficient and uh, uh, reliable payment system that uh, uh, contributes to, for the creation of uh, uh, cash light society in the Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, even when that is uh, designed, uh, 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 more than 120 stakeholders were participated on that uh, in, the, in the designing of uh, the strategy. So the engagement wow. is very, very broad. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and unfortunately, that will be our time for today. Um, I mean, we've you know discussed so many great topics. There's a couple of questions that just came in last minute. I'm sorry, we won't have time to address it now, but we'll continue to have similar webinars that we will invite you to. Ultimately, you know, we've learned that interoperability is a public good, which requires bringing um, competing interests together, balancing cooperations with competition, and there seems to be a push towards awareness, which is really important. So it was great to learn that. And everyone in the ecosystem has a role to play and we should all care about it because it plays a huge role in the sector and developing the sector and financial inclusion. Again, thank you to all of our speakers for joining us and for your time and sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. And for all the participants for asking great questions, uh, we will be sharing the recorded um, link on our website and Twitter account. So be on the lookout for that. And thank you again, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.